All right. Uh, welcome to the Be Positive, Stay Positive podcast. My name is Nat, uh, and I'm here for you three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, to give you the keys to the door to open your happiness so you can feel as happy as I am. It's easy. You can do it. And today, I have the leading expert on the law of attraction and one of the top five inspirational speakers in the world. Top 50, I'm sorry, <laughs> inspirational speakers in the world. Uh, I've admired uh, Mr. Vitali from a long, long time back. Um, He's a globally famous author, marketing guru. He's been in movies, TV, radio, personality. He's a musician. That's good stuff. And <laughs> has many best-selling books, including Money, Love, Speed, The Attraction Factor, and Anything is Possible. And he's been on Larry King Live, CNN, CBS, CNBC, ABC, Fox, just about everywhere you can imagine. He's been featured in the New York Times. He was in one of my favorite movies, The Secret, where I first was experienced, uh, experienced Joe and his teachings. He's a seeker and a learner. He's created the Miracles Coaching and Zero Limits Mastery programs to help people achieve their life's purpose. Joe is not only known as a thinker, but as a healer, clearing people's subconscious minds of limiting beliefs. Welcome to the show, Joe. How are you today? Well, look where I'm at. I'm doing great. I'm positive. I'm hanging with you. <laughs> That's the only way to be. <laughs> right, right, right. I love your message. I love your energy. I love what you're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, same, same goes for you. Um, uh, I'm, I've been inspired by you ever since I first saw The Secret and all the uh, speakers on The Secret, and it stuck with me. I've watched that movie, I can't even tell you how many times, and I was hooked right from then. And then I started following all the people that were in it. And you were a person that really stuck out in my mind to me because you're, you're always freaking smiling, just like me. <laughs> and I, I wondered, uh, as I dug into more about you and followed you and listened to you, you speaking, you speak so much from the heart. It's so natural for you. And you look like you clearly enjoy what you're doing. So my first question is a pretty global, easy question. What is your mission in life and how... How do you want to be remembered on this planet? Well, that's a big, big opening question. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my, my mission is to inspire people to go for their dreams and to attain them. And if I can inspire them through my books or my music or my speaking or some of the movies I'm in or in some other way, shape or form, then so be it. But I believe that's my life mission, to inspire people, to ignite the fire within them. And I'm doing it in whatever way feels passionate and uh, immediate to me. When I want to write a book, I write a book. I came out with Money Love Speed, got excited, promoted it. Two weeks later, I released The Art and Science of <laughs> Results, all because I was excited. I released 15 albums, music albums, in about seven years, wow. six of them singer-songwriter albums. My drummer has the same name as me. Joe Vitale, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for Crosby, Stills, Nash. He's Joe Walsh's drummer and probably every rock and roller since the 1970s. And so, um, but I'm trying to do raising vibrations and putting smiles on faces, much like you've mentioned, with music as well. And I'm hoping when I appear in movies or in a podcast like this and people hear me or see me, I hope that in some way I elevate them, that I inspire them. So I, I'm, I'm here to inspire. Well, you have. You've, you've inspired this guy a lot. And I know just by following you for so many years and seeing how many lives you've touched, you've inspired so many people. And like I said, it seems like you really, it's, like a, it's almost like an adrenaline rush, like a drug. Because when you feel <laughs> that you're helping somebody else and just from your experiences and how you feel and how you think, and you can convey that to somebody else, and it, it helps them, there's, there's no money can't buy that feeling, right? You're absolutely right. And you demonstrate it because I can tell that you're a guy that's already plugged in. But you're plugged in because you're doing what you love and you're doing what makes a difference. And I think that's the key for every single person. Everybody listening or watching this, they don't have to be authors. They don't have to be drummers. They don't have to do any of the things you and I are doing. But there's something for them to do. And what I'm encouraging people to do is look within themselves. In fact, at this point, as we're making this recording, there's a pandemic going on. People are being told to go to their room and stay in their room. And I actually think that's a good thing. Uh, we've all been globally sent to our room, which I think is a spiritual enforced meditation retreat. 
And here's our opportunity to go inside, literally, not just inside the house, but inside our bodies and our minds and our souls to find out what makes us sing, what makes us alive, what makes us feel that juice of life. And for somebody like you, it might be doing this or playing the drums on stage. For somebody like me, it might be doing this or writing my next book or being on stage speaking. For somebody else, it might be making the greatest carrot cake cupcakes of all time. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. But I think it's unique to each person and each person just needs to tune within. It doesn't have to be so global that it's cure cancer or cure the virus. But if you can, please do so. Right. If there's some other role, that's your role. That's your piece of the puzzle. That's your contribution to life. I'm making mine. You're making yours. People watching, listening, they can be making theirs. Right. I, and I try to tell people that when I talk to them, you, I'll get letters from, from listeners and they'll ask me that someone will say, I'm lost in life. I don't know what to do. And I just tell them, well, get quiet, get to your quiet place. Listen, what could you do? All day long, if money wasn't an option, what could you do to make you happy? If you didn't have to worry about money, find what that is and then do that. And, you know, do it 100% and envision your happiness. Visualize uh, your success, whether it's uh, you want a fancy car, you want a great job, or you want a great relationship, or you want that awesome carrot cake. Whatever it is that you love to do, people seem to stifle what they love to do to try to go with society, I think, and try to go with what other people think they should do and what other people accept. And it's hard since we were raised that way to fit in from school to college, you're raised to fit into this certain mold. And it's the people that take all that knowledge and all that discipline and then use that to follow their dreams and their heart and actually give back. And I think, like you said, this pandemic is a blessing in disguise. I really do because I've seen families come so close, get so close right. together. I've seen people be nice to each other. For people to actually realize that this can be used as a positive thing and you're you're not stuck with your family, you get to be with your family all this time. Mm. And if they, it's all in a perspective on how you look at it. Well, I also see that this is an opportunity. I really understand when people are nervous about losing their jobs or the bills are still coming, but the money's not still coming. I understand. I was homeless for a while. I was in poverty for 10 years. And so I know what it's like to struggle and be desperate and uncertain and confused. But I also know the other side of it. I've been saying that there's two viruses going on right now. The first virus is the one the mainstream news won't shut up about, and that's the one that they're scaring us with. And I'm not dismissing that virus. I do say take care of your health, do what's been suggested for you to do, maintain that. But the other virus is worse than the first virus. The other virus is a virus of the mind. And that virus is fear. When we fall into fear and we really go into that negative dark place where we get concerned, and maybe there is a a rightful concern because we don't know what the next day is going to be. But we have to balance that with the reality of we never know what the next day is going to be. Right. (laughs) We don't know what this afternoon is going to be. I don't know what the next minute is going to be. We honestly don't know. We can make bets, but, boy, it could be a losing gamble there. So I, I look at this as a great opportunity for people to learn to work from home to learn to create a product or service that they can deliver online. A hundred years ago when we had the last plague or uh, virus that went around, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have the means of information exchange or communication that we do now. And it's amazing because all the times we said, boy, if I only had the time to do fill in the blank, well, we now have the time to do fill in the blank. And I tell people, this is the greatest opportunity for you. Go over to YouTube and type in how to, and whatever you wanted to learn, type it in. How to play the saxophone. How to bake carrot cake cookies. How to open my website online. How to create my first digital product. How to be an entrepreneur at home. How to, whatever it is, it's there and it's free. So I want people to lose the fear and move into faith. I want them to move into the place where, much like your shirt says, be positive. I love that phrase. I want one of your shirts. I think the whole idea of being positive, I have one that says expect miracles. And getting that out, plus behind me says be happy. On the other side, it says expect miracles. You're wearing be positive. This whole mindset is where we need to go because we have a choice. We can fall into fear 
which will cripple us. We won't do anything. We'll lower our immune system. We'll make ourselves sick or, or available to be sick. So we have a choice. We can go with fear or we can go with faith. Both of them are equally available to us. And faith feels so much better because there's hope there, there's empowerment there, there's possibility there, there's choice there, there's opportunity there. So I want people to go in that direction. What I'm encouraging people to do right now is, again, look within. What have you always wanted to do? What would you do if money wasn't an object? What would you do if you weren't afraid? What if you do? What would you do if you can get the skills or the connections or the education? Because you can probably do it now right where you're sitting or at least learn how to do it now right it's all it's all there all the information is there and like you said with the internet we are being uh, information is so readily available and there's really no excuse to be ignorant to something to learn or whatever's going on in society uh with you know you can objectively look at it and make a good opinion you know make your own opinion about it mm -hmm. um but it's, i have an another question that I get a lot from my listeners and I talk about the law of attraction and I, I talk about being positive and I tell people I make my life as simple as when I wake up in the morning, I say, thank you. I show gratitude because the first thing in the morning I, I wake up and I go, it's really this simple. Cool. I got to wake up again. <laughs> Not like, oh crap, I got to go to work. You know, I don't think about that. It's like I get to, and I, my perspective has always been, this is cool. I, this physical part of life, this existence, this physical part, is really the, the part where we have to learn how to love and learn how to, to give and how to be, become one with everybody. And then we move on to whatever the next phase is. But how, what would you say to people that, that like, I'm sure you get it too, because you're such a positive person. How can you be so positive all the time when there's so much negative in the world? How can you say that you wake up every day and you're, you're grateful for what you have? If you're out of work, if you're in a pandemic, if you have a disease, if you, you get up and you stub your toe and it ruins your whole day, what do you say to people that say they can't wake up and be positive and feel grateful because of their situation? So I'm going to tell you a story that I, I've gotten to tell in two or three different movies, and it's become quite popular. It's known as the pencil story. But before I tell you the pencil story, I want to tell people life is an optical illusion. Life is an optical illusion. You get whatever you believe. If you want to believe that it is a lousy world and the opportunities are limited and there's lack and there's scarcity and it's dangerous and it's unhappy and all kind of bad things happen to good people and blah, 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 you will find the evidence for that. You will find it. You will find books. You'll find websites. You'll find people. You'll find statistics. Leave that there for a second. If you believe that the world is a happy place, much like you, and you believe that there's opportunities and that there is a choice available and abundance available and good available and good things happen to good people available, you can find the evidence for that too. There's books, there's statistics, there's people, there's websites, all of it. All right, here's the, the million dollar question. If both of those is real, which one do you want? It's an optical illusion. Life gives you what you believe, and you get to choose. So while I let people think about that, the pencil story, way back when I was in poverty, and that was right after being homeless, and this was in Houston, Texas, and this was several decades ago, I was doing all the right things. I was reading the right books, attending the right events that were free because I couldn't afford them. Um, we didn't have the internet at that point, but I was absorbing all the positivity I could. And boy, it wasn't making a dent because I was bitter. I was unhappy. I was belligerent. I was <laughs> fragile. I was melancholy. I was all of those negative things. And I kept hearing about gratitude. And I thought, yeah, I'll be grateful when there's something for me to be grateful for. Right. And that's what most people say, right? And so I remember hearing the gratitude bit over and over and over. And I thought, well, I'm going to try this gratitude crap. And I picked up a pencil. This is a pen, but I picked up a pencil at the time, one of those number two pencils, the yellow ones with an eraser. And I said, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be grateful for the pencil. And I was not. I was not grateful. And I really stressed this because I picked up the pencil to try a, a gratitude exercise, and I was not grateful for that pencil. And I said, yeah, I'll be grateful for this pencil. I can write a grocery list. I can write a suicide note. I can write a song. I can write a poem. And I was not grateful. But as I kept going, and I thought, I can write a manifesto. I can write a play. I can write a movie. I can write jokes. I can write love letters. 
my energy started to change and I started to truly become grateful. I went, oh, wow, just this piece of lead, this stick with a piece of lead in it is actually a doorway to a whole world that I could record my thoughts or my fantasies or my visions or visualizations and so forth. And then I turned it over and there was the eraser and I went, oh, oh my God, oh my God, he's an eraser. <laughs> I can erase the suicide note. I can change the ghost <laughs> list. I can change and tweak the song. And I went from zero, no gratitude to going greatest invention of all time. And I, I swear to God, every time I tell the story and it's happening, even right now, my energy changes. My, my skin is tingling because I feel more bubbly and exuberant. Here's the punchline. When I did the pencil story, I was broken unknown. And after I did the pencil gratitude, I was still broken unknown. But I felt different. I felt happier. I felt more positive. And nothing changed in my immediate world. Nothing changed in that, in that moment. But I did. And I did it flippantly by just pretending that I was grateful. As I pretended, I became truly grateful. And that opened the window in my soul because life began to change in that moment. I began to see over days, weeks, and months, opportunities and so forth, and I began to see more of the sunshine and the positivity in life. And as I pursued it, pursued it life became better and better. Opportunities started coming around. Internet comes around, I'm one of the first on it. I've become known as an internet guru. I keep doing my spiritual work. I get invited to be in an unknown movie called The Secret that changes history for everybody, including me more books, more engagements, and it just goes on and on and on. But I think you can trace it all back to a very angry, skeptical man who's broken unknown, who picks up a pencil and pretends he's grateful until he is. Wow. So that's, that's awesome. Um, and so I, from what you're saying then, if you're pretending and you keep telling yourself and trying to convince yourself, if you don't believe it, then it's not going to happen. So by re repetitively, that's a tough word to say, repetitively oh. <laughs> telling yourself that you're going to be successful, you're going to be happy, it, isn't that putting uh, the thoughts in your subconscious where most of your life really comes from? Because we only use 5% of our conscious brain is only, it's like, that's yeah. what's in control. But getting it to your subconscious is what you really need to do, right? Yeah, absolutely. Those are some of the things that people misunderstand about the movie The Secret or about the Law of Attraction, is that it doesn't happen on the conscious level. It happens on the subconscious level. So in other words, we will attract what we unconsciously believe and expect. We can sit there all day and say, I'm going to attract money and just keep repeating it. But you won't attract money if subconsciously you think money's bad or money's evil or there's a shortage of money or you don't deserve money or money will corrupt you. If you have any number of limiting beliefs or negative beliefs around money, you will subconsciously block it, even though consciously you're walking around going, I want money and I'm doing all the right stuff. This is why I wrote Money Loves Speed to help people understand that it is in the subconscious mind. In fact, there's what's called the reticular activating system, which is in the back of the skull that helps you get goals. But you have to know how to operate it. And I talk about it in the book. And people need to understand that visualization is what communicates in the subconscious. So when you're sitting there and you're imagining things going bad, you are communicating to your subconscious mind to focus on bad things. You will see more bad things and probably experience more bad things. But if you focus on what you would prefer to have, do, or be, and start visualizing that, you tell the subconscious mind, this is what I would like to have, do, or be. Then you add emotion to it. You can't create without emotion, but most people are focused on uh, hate and fear, which are very powerful emotions. But when you focus on those and you add imagery to it, you start to attract more of that to you, which we see a lot of on Facebook. Because the haters and the people that fall into fear keep reinforcing it by being focused on it. So I teach people, especially in the book and other opportunities that I get, to train your mind to go for what you want. You choose what you want. You find the visual that represents what you want. You fuel it with the energy of love, passion, appreciation, 
That's also a powerful emotion that will help bring it to you. And then you repeat it. You keep looking at it in the morning. You think about it throughout the day or you print out your graphics. You can look at it or put it on a vision board or bathroom mirror, or put it on the top of your drum. I don't know, but you put it in different places to remind you of it. Hey, that's, that's great. Hey, I've, I've had a vision board uh, back years ago. I, I, I listened to Jack Canfield. He talked about a vision board uh, and, uh, and also, um, I've listened to a wide range of people because I don't think that any one person has the answer. Some people have a better way, you know, just like, you know, you convey things to people and certain people will get, get what you talk about. Other people will lean more towards uh, somebody like Napoleon Hill or something that he talks about, or, you know, you, you gravitate to who you vibe with and I, I gravitated towards you. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, but, um, uh, the, the fact that your subconscious actually controls your mind and a lot of people can't get to their subconscious because they don't believe that their subconscious controls their mind. They'll say, I, I want to be rich. Well, I envisioned rich. I envisioned my, I thought about driving that Mercedes and having that big house and I didn't get it. So the law of attraction doesn't work, you know? And if you say that, whatever you say out loud it is what becomes your reality eventually, I believe. If you keep saying it's not going to work, then it's not going to work, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, boy, there's so much to talk about this to explain it to people. First of all, I, I've heard a lot of what you're talking about, and I always tell people the law of attraction works. That's why it's called a law. But it's pulling into your reality what you are subconsciously focusing on. And the way to know what you're actually believing subconsciously is to look at your life. What's in it? that you want and what's not in it that you're lacking. You have beliefs that are matching the reality you have right now. Your reality is matching your subconscious mindset. People refuse to believe that though, don't they? Yes, they do. <laughs> which is why they're also creating the continuation of it. Their belief in it not being working is creating the reality that it doesn't look like it's working, which proves that it's working. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I was having lunch with a woman a long time ago, and she said, I tried affirmations, but affirmations don't work for me. And I paused, and I thought, oh, wait a minute. And I told her, I said, do you realize what you just said is an <laughs> affirmation? Affirmations don't work for me is an affirmation that affirmations don't work. Right. So she is affirming something and then looking for the evidence that it's not working to say the affirmations don't work. But actually, she's proving affirmations work by the very fact of the lack of seeing anything different in her life. This is why this is, uh, it gets tricky because people try to outthink themselves. And what they really need is they need to read the success literature, Jack Canfield, my book, Bob Proctor, this, you know, Earl Nightingale. I'm rereading Maxwell Malta's book, Psycho Cybernetics from 1960. I'm rereading it right now. They need to reread that stuff. They need to listen to the audios. There's so much audio material. Almost all the books that I just mentioned are all on audio. People can listen to audio versions of that. They need to question their own beliefs, their own statements. They really need to meditate on this. And maybe more importantly, they might need to get a mentor, a coach. I had the greatest breakthroughs and the greatest results when I finally got a coach. Because a coach is somebody who can re, who can objectively listen to you and report back to you what you're seeing and saying that you don't notice. We're a lot like the fish that's in the water. We don't know that we're in a fishbowl. You know, we look at reality and we think this is the way life is. No, it's not the way life is. It's the way your life is right. based on your beliefs. You change your beliefs and that reality that you think is concrete changes. That's why life is an optical illusion. My God, there's so many things that <laughs> depth to all this. <laughs> well, I didn't want it to be just a little cheesy interview like, hey, how you doing? Thanks a lot. Great book. I'll talk to you later, you know? <laughs> Not that at all. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, when you're talking about the beliefs and the one little phrase that I actually have on my desktop at work that is so simple and it just explains so much is that if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Right. Right. And if you really honestly believe that, then it changes your whole perspective. It's the people that say, oh, well, you could do it, but I can't. Well, if I could do it, 
you could do it. If you believe you can, it might be diff more difficult for you. You might have to go through different steps or get a mentor or whatever you have to do. But if you really want to do something and you really put your mind to it and you believe it and you're, there's emotions behind it, then it will happen. It has to, just like I said, it's the law. It has to, because if just like the, if the news, if you talk about the news perpetuating the same story over and over again, they're pounding in your head, they're programming you to accept things. So your subconscious is now all the, getting all this stuff from the news. So you're accepting it as reality. The same thing I think goes for your subconscious. If you keep bombarding your subconscious with whatever it is, positive or negative, it becomes your reality. I love that quote that you mentioned. It's from Henry Ford. Mm -hmm. And it, it is true. And I wanted to mention something because you're a drummer. I guess some of your audience are musicians or want to be musicians. I, I'm only guessing. I don't honestly know. And you know that I'm a musician, but I'm a young musician. I've only been doing it for six years or so. I wasn't growing up like you played the drums when you were three. Didn't have that. I wanted to play a guitar, but my father gave me an accordion. So, you know, being from an Italian family, he wanted to hear polkas, not, <laughs> not the Beatles. <laughs> but a few years ago when I decided I wanted to learn how to write my own songs, sing, go in the studio, record my own albums, blah, blah, blah. I remember really doubting myself. And this is, this is me being transparent because I want people to relate to this. So I set a goal. I want to be a recording musician. I want to go and create and record my own music. With me playing lead guitar, me writing my own songs, me singing my own songs, gathering a band, the whole bit. But I didn't know how to do any of that. And I took a songwriting workshop with Kevin Welch and Ray Wiley Hubbard, which are they're in the Americana field, and they're here in Texas, which is where I am currently. And Ray Wiley Hubbard talked about his own insecurities when it came to performing, learning how to play music. He had to learn finger picking at one point because he was doing open chords and he just kept playing the same open chords. <laughs> and as a full time professional musician, he, he and everybody around him said, you need to learn something else. <laughs> and, but he doubted it, just like I doubted learning anything. And he said he learned to ask himself a question. And this is what I want to give to everybody that's watching or listening. It's a question I ask myself. When I had doubts about singing or I had doubts about writing songs, Ray Wiley had doubts about learning finger picking. The question he would ask, and I ended up asking, was where's the proof that you can't do it? Where's the proof that you can't do it? Because in reality, there is none. When I was about to go on stage and, and sing on stage with my band, I called them the Band of Legends, and it was Dr. Joe and the Band of Legends, and I'm performing for the first time in public as a singer-songwriter. It was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Exciting and terrifying at the same th time. It's one thing to stand on stage as a speaker. I mean, if I forget something, I pause, or if I need a drink of water, I pause. But if you're singing a song, the train's moving, man. You forget <laughs> the lyric, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> They don't pause for you. <laughs> and, and so I was terrified, but I remember thinking, where's the proof I can't do it? There's none. There is none. You may have doubts you can't do it, but those doubts are that form of belief. And when you look at beliefs and realize, wait a minute, do I want to do this or not? If I really want to do this, then let's pull away the, the doubt and let's move forward and find out how it goes. And in my case, I got a standing ovation and tasted blood. I wanted more of it. Yeah, once you get that feedback, it's like, oh, right. more. <laughs> right, you, know, you get the audience approval and the rush of energy, and yeah, there's adrenaline there. <laughs> yeah, you know. yeah. There's there's no matching the adrenaline when you play a song and you're you're doing something you love, like playing music, and the crowd's like, man, I love that song. You guys are great, and it just takes them out of their reality and brings them into yours, and it's like it's just such a happy place. That's you know? great. Yeah. Nice. And I love that. And, yeah. and like with, with this podcast, when I started doing it, um, not many people were listening, but I, I didn't care. I, I, and I still, I still don't care about the numbers. Uh, um, like I said, I listen to a lot of people. One thing that Gary Vaynerchuk said is that don't look at the numbers. Don't look at what other people are saying. Follow your dream. Don't give a crap about what anybody else says about what you're doing. If you believe in it and you have a message, then go for it because you know, that's how, that's how you got to where you're at. That's how everybody gets to where they're at in a success plateau. 
is by I love, not. I love that you said that. I want to interrupt you real quick just to ahead. applaud you because it isn't about the numbers. It isn't about the approval of the people. It's about you doing what you love and hoping that it connects with the right people who want to hear from you, which is working for you. Mm -hmm. I was interviewed by London Real, which has a really popular online TV show. I, I was that. interviewed live by them in London a year and a half ago. And because of the pandemic, they're doing interviews like this. They're doing it virtually with them in their office and me in my office. And they interviewed me again just the other day. Mm -hmm. And Brian Rose, who's the genius behind it, said he has done 650 episodes. Wow. Because 650 episodes, and they have a massive following at this point. But the first five were terrible. Yeah. <laughs> he says, if you want to see what to do wrong, go watch the first five episodes of London Real. <laughs> but that's the point with all of us. My very first songs weren't that great. But I knew, I also studied with Melissa Etheridge. I got to stay, go to her house and be in her studio and work with her on a couple albums. And I dedicated my last album, The Great Something, to her. Cool. And I remember thinking that it, she and I both agreed, you just keep doing it and you will always get better. The first ones out of the gate, you stumble through. Mm -hmm. And this is true for everything that we ever try. Whether it is your show, whether it is my songs, whether it is Brian Rose with London Real, the first things we do are usually rough around the edges. But as we keep doing, look at my books. I said I wrote 80 books. My very first book, <laughs> 1984, and I'm glad it's out of print. <laughs> <laughs> the ones uh, today I'm much more proud of. Oh yeah, you should be. They're fantastic. I, I, <clears throat> I, I just, I've never been a huge reader per se because anytime I had a free moment in life, I was playing drums. Um, but I decided uh, because of what people have been saying and, and the podcast that I'm going to write a book because it, you know, it's, it's just another way to get the message out there to people. And some people want a tangible product that they can read and they can highlight or they can go back and read it again. So I'm working on a book and I've been working on it for about six months and it's, it's, it's coming along, but I've never really done it. And then I look at someone like you who's written 80 books and it's like, you go, ah, I think I'll write a book today. And you pop one out. <laughs> how do you, how do you stay focused and how do you get a book done so fast? Like you said, you did that one book in two weeks. <laughs> I got to around here with a full of a book that I, I know is behind me. I'm going to tell you this story. Okay. First of all, anybody who hangs around me ends up being an author. Uh, both of my wives became authors. My, my, my partner right now is an author. My father, when he was 90 years old, 90 years old, no writing experience, no literary experience, I made him an author when he was 90, made him a, an author again when he was 91, wow. made him an author again when he was 92, and he died by 93. But he died an author. Everybody around me becomes an author because I see books in people. <clears throat> Remember the old... Um, Bruce Willis movie, The Sixth Sense, where the boy says, I see dead people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see books in people. <laughs> <laughs> I see books in people. So there, there is a, uh, God, again, so much to talk about. There is a vocal co coach, Jamie Ventura, Tura, Ventura, in Ohio, and he wrote me on Facebook a few years ago. And he says, hey, Dr. Vitale, he says, I had a dream about you last night. And he says, the universe wants you to write a book for musicians. And it could be called Mind Over Music. And it could be about the law of attraction, positive thinking, and how musicians could apply it. And he says, I'm real excited about this, and I can't wait for you to write the book. And I thought about it, and I thought, wait a minute. The dream came to him. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote him, and I said, I think the universe wants you to write the book, not me. I said, the dream came to you. If it, the universe wanted me to write it, it would have come to me. So to his credit, he took it on and he said, all right, I'm going to write a book called Mind Over Music. I'd like you to review it. I'd like you to write the forward to it. I'm here to tell you he wrote it in 14 days <laughs> as if he was on fire. And we did come out with the book. It's called Mind <laughs> Over Music. Wow. Mind Over Music. It's a break through the blocks to get into the studio and on stage today. I'm going to have to check that out. That's cool. Mind over. It's on Amazon. Yeah. And so I'm bringing it up. You say you're working on a book, which is fantastic. I applaud that. Of course, I don't know anything about your book, but I encourage you to go forward with it. 
So the very first thing is most people struggle with writing because they are editing as they are writing. Yeah. In other words, as they're putting the book together, they're writing down a sentence, they scratch it out and go, oh, I didn't mean that. Or they write a sentence down and, oh, I forgot what comes after that. Or they write a sentence down and go, oh, does that say it well? They write a sentence down and they go, oh, did I misspell that word? They can't write, they can't create, and they can't enjoy it if they're editing as they're writing. So the big lesson number one is when you're writing, just write. Just dump. I call it a brain dump. It's that first draft. You just empty the contents of your brain onto the computer, into a file, whatever. That's how he got this done in two weeks or so. Hmm. And actually, I've written books in a couple of weeks just by doing it that way. When you separate the writing from the editing, you take away a lot of the stalling because editing slows you up when you're trying to create. So if you go back to your book and you just start writing it, do whatever the next chapter, the next section, whatever it is, but try not to edit it. Just keep burning up the page by getting it done. Later, you separate the process. Later, you can go and edit it or hire somebody to edit it or hand it to a handful of friends and have them edit it. But then you can start to rearrange things. You can start to piece it together. You can start to put it together in some sort of way that makes sense. But just that alone, separating the process will, will make it easier. The other thing is I always ask people, what are you most comfortable with? Meaning, if you are a writer, like I am a writer, I, I enjoy writing, so I can do it at the computer. I can type. But I've met people who were speakers. My father, my father didn't write, but he told fantastic stories. And I said, Dad, why don't you just turn on a recorder? In his case, he wanted a cassette recorder, which they still make them. Mm -hmm. He wanted a, a cassette recorder and those 90-minute little cassettes, which I bought for him. And every morning, he'd get up, do his workout, and then he'd hold the mic and he'd tell a story. So he recorded it vocally. And when he was done, he sent me the tapes, which I had transcribed. Then we had them edited. Then we had them massaged. Then we had them formatted into a book. So on his 90th birthday, in fact, there's a YouTube video of me handing him his book on oh, his how cool. and which is still moving to me today. And he didn't see it coming, but he didn't write the book. He spoke the book. Actually, let me show you one more example. This, The Art and Science of Results, is officially my most recent book. I did not write it. I did not write this book. We went into the recording studio, and I had a fellow with me who interviewed me, much like you're interviewing me now. He interviewed me. He asked me questions about the art and science of results, and the subtitle is The Nine Most Powerful Ways to Get Clear Blocks. So it, everything we were saying was recorded. His questions to me, my answers, my answers were spontaneous. I didn't have any papers or notes or research, and I didn't write anything. When we were done, an editor stripped out all of his questions. We massaged all of my answers. An editor put them into book form, put them into paragraphs and so forth, and that's what became this book. Wow basically a transcript of an interview without the interviewer. So I'm saying all this to you and to anybody listening is that you can speed up the process of writing by separating the writing and editing part and also look to what's your strength. If it is writing, then write. If it is speaking, then maybe speak and record it. There's an app called Rev, R-E-V, and mm -hmm. I use it all the time. It's an iPhone app. I push Rev. I start uh, dictating basically what I want to say. Rev will transcribe it for, I think they went up in price. It's $1.25 a minute, $1.25 a minute. And they're almost instantaneous. Wow. So Rev, uh, Rev.com and Rev is an app, R-E-V. I can talk forever about books because I love books and have helped a lot of people become authors. <laughs> I know you do. And I'm hoping that it rubs off on me a little bit so I can get this book published. <laughs> I want to read your book. So I, there you go right there. You got your first reader or there you go. The, I want to see your book. So finish the freaking book. <laughs> you want to write the forward? That would be great. <laughs> Let me see it first. The, the yeah, right, right. <laughs> you don't buy a car without actually test driving the first time. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> Uh, let's see, uh, a couple other questions I have. Um, going back to uh, your music, uh, you say you've only been playing for about six years. First of all, how many, how many different instruments do you play? 
<laughs> play well or just no no because uh, playing music is all about having fun it's like i tell about people that's a great drummers, they say oh i'm not going to be as good of a drummer as you it's like but do you enjoy it they say yeah and i'm telling you and you've already accomplished accomplished what you need to I, I love your definition thank you um harmonica guitar saxophone cool well i've listened to some of your stuff and it's it's really cool. It's different. It's a it's a different style of writing, and your your personality comes out in your writing as it right. does with other artists. But it's I listen to it, and I'm I'm thinking, okay, when when people hear, oh, it's it's motivational, or it's coming from a, a, a motivational speaker or a healer, and he's got music, it's like, oh boy, it's going to be violins and all this stuff, and <laughs> and then I listen to yours, I'm like, it's not that at all. <laughs> no, I, my band is basically rock and roll. I know. I love it. <laughs> You know, my drummer, Joe Vitale from Ohio, and Joe Walsh's drummer, he's got a rock and roll, heavy rock and roll background. And my bass player, Glenn Fukunaga, is with the Dixie Chicks and Robert Plant, and wow. he, he can basically play anything. And Daniel Barrett is with a famous band called Porter Davis, which is an award-winning blues rock band, mm -hmm. and he's the engineer, lead guitar, and producer. So the people I pulled together have a rock background. And actually what I was trying to do is, is create positive lyrics to memorable, catchy songs. And the reason I wanted to do it is that I use the Rolling Stones as a great example, because back in the 1960s when they were singing, you can't always get what you want, that became an affirmation for the culture. You can't mm -hmm. always get what you want. And so we, we live today listening to the song going, man, that's a cool song, love the Rolling Stones, but not thinking that the lyrics are affirmations that are not positive. And so I wanted to create music that was memorable, but at the same time, positive. And again, I'm new at doing it. So I'm, I'm pretty proud of some of the songs and some I'd like a do-over. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. I, I'm, I just, it's, uh, it's just an amazing feeling when it comes to being able to do that. How do you help somebody to release their limitations? So happiness, money, uh, prosperity, so all that stuff can come into the life. How do you um, th help them to release that? And I, um, on top okay. of that, you also have mentor courses that you do, and you could talk about that, and uh, maybe some people would like to go there also. Well, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the coaching. I mean, I've got different programs. One's called Miracles Coaching. It's at miraclescoaching.com, www.miraclescoaching.com. I have another one that's called uh, Zero Limits Mentoring, www.zerolimitsmentoring.com, spell out all the words. But here's what I think we need to do, and you're already doing it, and I hope I'm doing it. We inspire people by example. We inspire people by example. We can tell them what books to read. I have all kinds of material that's free. I have a website, vitalilifemastery.com. Um, my last name, vitalilifemastery.com. Lots of things to buy, but also lots of things that are free. Attract Money Now is free over there. Beginner's Guide to Miracles is free over there. Beginner's Guide to a bunch of other things are free over there. I can give people things, but I can't make them do it. I can't right. make them use it. I can't make them apply it. And even this, I mentioned this is my latest book. Uh, I'm charging $2, and people can have the audio and the ebook of this entire thing for only $2. What a deal. Yes, go to moneylovespeedbook.com, moneylovespeedbook.com, and it's there. But again, I'm doing my best to give it to people, but they don't always pick up the baton or the torch and run with it. So I really feel that what we have to do is inspire people. And you're doing it with your show, and I'm, I'm glad and I applaud you for getting your following, and I want you to keep going because you're passionate, you've got momentum, and you are inspiring people. You're a, you're a bright light to me Thank and you. others. It's a great joy to meet you here. Thank and you. the stories that I tell about being homeless, it's to tell if I was homeless and have turned into this, then whatever people are going through, they can get through. And I'm not the only one. You're not the only one. There are lots of people out there. 
Jason Mraz has a new song called Look for the Good, Look for the Good. And it's that kind of mentality, look for the good. It's, it's seeping into the culture, it's seeping into the music. And all of us can be inspirations to other people who are kind of stumbling and still in the dark. When they see us, at first they might be confused, but then they get a little curious going, why is that person happy? Why is that person attracting what they're attracting? What's, what's that person's story? Let's go unlock them. And at that point, maybe they'll read a book. Maybe they'll watch The Secret. Maybe they'll watch some of the other movies that are coming out or read some of the success literature that's out there in the world. But the bottom line for me is live my life in the highest most virtuous way I can and tell the stories that I know from my own life and lives of others to do my best to inspire people. That's how I think we affect them. Right. And, and you are, you, you're affecting so many people and to see you speak on stage in front of thousands of people and you're just like, you're, it's just like this, you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I'm nervous because of who you are, you know, but just the fact that you can go up there and talk in front of so many people and have so many people listen to you and they, people go to all these seminars and all this stuff and you really only get through to a handful of them because they think that just by watching or reading or watching the video that their life is going to get better and they're not taking action to get better. So then they blame it like, oh, I, I, I can't be, have, be, uh, have money because uh, of this. It's, it's not, it didn't work. You know, the book didn't work. I read the book. It didn't work. Well, you didn't apply what you learned, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, when it, for people that really think that they're positive and they really are telling themselves, uh, uh, I'm not going to be an alcoholic. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to be a loser. I'm not going to be mean. I'm not going to show hate. I'm going to be positive and happy. And they start really thinking that and saying that to themselves over and over. And then they say they're, they, they want to be wealthy. So, you know, like I've said this, I, I'd like to have, I'd like to make lots of money so I can help other people. I have a, a you know, I, I will give it away. I don't need it. I'm, I'm doing well enough to where I don't have to be filthy rich, but I'd like to, so I can help other people. So in the front of my mind, I'm like, I say, I want to have extra money. I'd like to make more money. But in the, my, I'm realizing actually as I'm talking to you right now is that in the back of my mind, I don't care about money. I want more to help, but I really just, it, it doesn't mean as much to me as the experience and as the emotions that I'm conveying to people. So how, what would you tell somebody like me who wants to en enhance their financial position, mm -hmm. but in the back of your mind, really doesn't give a crap about money. <laughs> well, I actually think that's a wonderful place to be because it isn't about the money. It is about a mission. It is about making a difference. It is about sharing. And it'll sound self-serving, but I really believe that uh, you would benefit from reading this book or listening to the audio if you don't really want to read the book. And again, $2, money, love, speed, book.com, and it's yours. But also, let me quickly tell you a story. And we'll probably have to go at that point because I'm down mm -hmm. to the wire. But there was a man who was homeless in Thailand, and I met him two years ago. He had been homeless 15 years previous. So when I met him, he wasn't homeless, and he had this success story to tell me. But he said when he was 20 years old, he was homeless, he was in Thailand, he was sleeping on the beaches, he had no money, no car, no connections, and he didn't even speak the language. He was from Sweden and had gone over there partied away the last money he had, and he was broke, and he was desperate. He called a friend of his and asked for help. And the friend said, I'm not going to send you any money, but I'll send you a book. And I'm even appalled to even hear this, because I would have sent the book and some money. Yeah. But the friend said, I'm just going to send you a book. And he sent the book, The Secret, which was based on the movie, The Secret. And so the book arrives, and my homeless friend is mad. He's mad. He's enraged. I would he's be too. <laughs> he's starving. He needs money, but he's given a book. And he was told this book can change his life. And so he started to read it. And his mindset was, I'm going to prove this book wrong. I'm going to prove this stuff doesn't work. So he reads about visualization and affirmations and all the positive thinking stuff that you and I know. And he decided he'd focus on a cup of coffee because it seemed like well, that'd be easy, but at the same time, he didn't believe it. Somebody buys him a cup of coffee. So he says, well, I mean, that was probably a fluke. It was a coincidence. Let me try lunch. Somebody buys him lunch. Now he's got it. It's got his attention. And he says, well, let me try on getting a part-time job. He gets a part-time job. 
Point is, 15 years later, he is a billionaire with a B, billionaire. Wow. He has the largest real estate firm in Southern Thailand. He has 20 other businesses, including a gym, a law office, a coffee shops, gas station, and I forget what else. He has 200 employees. He's operating almost all of it from his phone. And he was 35 years old when I met him. Wow. And I was so inspired. I talked him into writing his book. And like I say, everybody becomes an author that hangs around me. And he's an author now. And his story is called Homeless to Billionaire. It's on Amazon. Homeless to Billionaire. And again, with him, with me, with his book, with my book, it is not about the money. The money is almost a, it's the equivalent of the pen I was holding earlier. It's a tool. It's a way to get something done. That's all. And when we strip off the emotion of survival or desperation around money or the judgment of it being bad or evil around money, then we can look at money as a useful tool, much like a pen. There's not, this isn't evil. Nobody says a pen's evil. And at the same time, it's a useful tool. Money's a useful tool. So all of this is in the nature of, I love that you're focused on, you want to help. That will allow money to actually come to you. I would suggest Money Loves Speed Book. I'm getting that book. I am going to read it and I'm going to listen to it. <laughs> I have to. Well, uh, Joe, it's, uh, it's been such a pleasure and such an honor to have you be on my show. Um, you've been such an inspiration to so many thousands and thousands of people, including myself. Um, I know that my listeners are going to get a lot from what you've said. Uh, I appreciate you taking so much time out of your day. Um, and because I've been watching, you've been doing interviews left and right. And you're, I was like, okay, as soon as we confirm this interview, you're popping up all over. I'm like, man, he's, <laughs> I wanted to be one of the first ones, but uh, I, um, I wasn't. Um, but well, I love uh, what you're doing. I love your energy. I love you. I love your people. Thank you for the honor of being here. I greatly enjoyed it. And I hope to meet you and maybe play some music on stage somewhere at some point. That would be awesome. Thank you for doing the show. And I'll put all the links to every, everything that you can get for your stuff, your videos, your books, or everywhere. It'll all be in the links below. Thank you again, Joe, for doing the show. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Adios. All right. Thank you.